we are going to look at building an internal data academy using the apprenticeship levy. Um, essentially, the goal for today is going to be demystifying the apprenticeship levy and tackling common misconceptions. So apprenticeships are quite a, it's a word with some history to it, a word with a lot of connotations, um, not necessarily aligned with the current situation of apprenticeship. So I'm going to look in more detail at that. So a little bit about me. Um, first thing, you can see I've changed my hair. Um, I come from a background of HR and learning and development. I've been working in learning and development for many years now. Um, I was formerly global training specialist for Booking.com, so I have travelled around the globe delivering different kinds of training interventions, um, training programs that I've designed and delivered. Um, since then, I've been working with startups and scaling organisations, and I'm now part of the Cambridge Spark team um, because I'm so passionate about the mission that we have here to transform the way that technical learning is engaged with in the UK, um, right down to the basics of delivery, assessment, and closing the digital skills gap, which we're going to look at a little bit more. And part of that is, of course, the apprenticeship programs, which is why you've joined us today. So a bit more about Cambridge Spark. Um, we're an ed tech company, and we provide personalized data science and software engineering training. Our team includes PhDs from top universities around the world with absolute passion and specialist knowledge in these areas. And they're helping us build our platform, Kate, and design fantastic training. So we want to make sure that any learner who joins us is going to be ready to hit the road running in your workplace. They can have practical skills a little bit different to the typical university graduate who may have some really great theory and academic knowledge but won't necessarily understand the workplace and the needs that you have within it. Which magically is exactly the same philosophy as behind apprenticeships. So that's why there is a natural synergy between the current apprenticeship initiative and the kind of training that we are already providing here at Cambridge Spark. So who is this webinar for? Well, hopefully you. Um, people who want to understand what on earth an apprenticeship is. People who've heard about this apprenticeship levy and want to understand more. Quite a few employers that I speak to know that they're paying the levy and their L&D budget has been significantly reduced by their CFO because this money's being held in the levy but they don't know what on earth to do with it. So if you're in that situation, you are in the right place. And people who are supporting early careers talent within their organization. So if you're involved in recruitment and you're looking to bring new people on board and perhaps diversify your workforce, apprenticeships are a great way to do that. We're gonna share some data and research with you along the way. So, learning interventions have increased productivity by 14% in 2018. And you can see that's not just one year in isolation, it's been a, a continuous growth. Where people are investing are in learning and employers are upskilling their staff, they're seeing a return on that investment through increased productivity. Um, which, if you've been following the national productivity stats, gives them a decided advantage over most of the other employers in the UK. We've got a productivity crisis. In the last seven years, learning innovation consistently delivered a 9% improvement in outcomes leading to growth, productivity, transformation, and profit. So you're not just seeing your people being more productive, you're seeing that making a difference to your, your profit as a business um, and your business success. So, some myth busting. Uh, apprenticeships have a very long history here in the UK. And as a result, 
they have a bit of an image problem, it's fair to say. So you will commonly hear misconceptions and may even believe some of these misconceptions, including the fact that apprenticeships are a thing of the past. They are historic. Um, or they're only for young people, school leavers as an alternative to university, um, people who perhaps haven't got GCSEs and want to do something more vocational, which ties into the next misconception that they're only for trades or manual work, um, practical skills, not for academic subjects or softer skills. Um, are they only for entry level roles? people who are brand new to the workplace, it's another myth. And the only big levy play, paying employers have access to apprenticeship. Um, we've heard a lot about this apprenticeship levy. Uh, we'll go into more details, but yes, only large employers with a high salary payroll um, are actually paying into the levy. This, very importantly, does not exclude smaller, non-levy paying employers from accessing that money. So we're going to talk about it a little bit more. So if you are thinking of this when we talk about apprenticeships, there is the cobbler teaching his young apprentice. I'm sorry, you are wrong. That is not what we're here to talk about today. In fact, the apprenticeships that we deliver and that you're going to find most typically look a lot more like this. So your standard workforce, um, people interacting, computers right in the center of this, not a lecturer stood at the front. It's people practical getting on with their day's work in the way that they're going to do typically. So although they remain important, Apprenticeships are no longer just about developing technical or vocational skills for a specific profession. Those apprenticeships do exist. There are many technical and vocational apprenticeships. There are also many skills focused, learning focused and digital focused apprenticeships. And it's the digital apprenticeships that we specialize in here at Cambridge Spa that you'll see different training providers specializing in different areas within the workplace. So, having said what it's not, what is an apprenticeship? So, first thing is, it is a long-term vocational learning program. It is learning about a workplace skill. It is long-term, the minimum apprenticeship can run for is 12 months and one day on program, and then you have an assessment after that. Um, a lot of them run for a longer time period. And it's not just learning in a classroom or learning in a university or learning in a training room. It incorporates what the apprentice is doing in their job on a day-to-day -day basis, in their employment. So they're still very much your employee they are still working and you are still generating fantastic work and revenue from them. They range in levels from level two to CSE up to level seven, which is a postgraduate equivalent. So if you think of a master's degree at a university, that's a level seven, and an apprenticeship can be anywhere on that spectrum in between. Very important, apprentices can be any age. They are not just your 16 to 18 year olds. And in fact, the majority of the apprentices that I know and the majority of the apprentices that we work with are over the age of 18. An apprenticeship is directly relevant to the job role that apprentice has been hired to do. This is set out in something called the apprenticeship standards. So for every apprenticeship, there's a guideline of what an apprentice must learn and also what they must be doing when they're not learning in a classroom or learning online, what their job looks like. And that job is somewhere where they are applying directly what they learn. So you can't have a florist learning data science, for example, unless they're managing some sort of fantastic data analytics behind how a large floristry firm 
transports its flowers. Um, so, the employer can collaborate with an external training provider to, de to deliver learning. An employer can also do this independently. Um, however, it does involve a lot of work. So many employers choose to use an external training provider who has to deal with the clients for you and support you and your learners throughout the program. Some distinctive elements of an apprenticeship training compared to standard conventional training that you may already be delivering in your workplace. The first is there is a requirement that an apprentice has 20% of the job training. So that's 20% of their contracted time to work with and learn brand new things rather than working on your projects and your deliverables. There is a reason for that, and we'll come in, we'll come back to that in a bit more detail. Um, but now what I'm going to say is that 20% of the training, there is a whole bunch of research that says even with that. Your apprentices tend to be more productive in the 80% that they're at work and generate more revenue in that 80% of their time that they're working for you than their peers who are not part of the apprenticeship program. Just their output, their passion tends to be higher. The apprenticeship is government accredited and co-funded. So the government does put money into it and the government does manage the quality control for apprenticeships and apprenticeship providers. And one of the ways they do that is bullet point assessment. Essentially, delivering internally in your organization. Someone's been through that new program at the end. This is assessed. You get a qualification at the end of the apprenticeship. And another important thing about that, training providers are not allowed to mark their own homework. It has to be an external third party who provides that assessment. So as I mentioned, there are different educational levels, ranging from one, which is your very basic GCSE, through to a PhD, that's in your formal education, uh, level eight, and on the spectrum, apprenticeships range between level two and level seven. So you can see how it compares to other subjects or the types of qualification. Apprenticeships need to be high quality training with serious kudos and tangible value, both to the apprentice and the employer. I work for a training provider. I know that if we aren't delivering on this, we don't have any clients. I also know it's a waste of time and money for you as employers if you're not generating revenue and tangible benefits. So you achieve that and also visualize that and measure it. So one of the things you will see is our training provision for apprenticeships. You've got a dashboard with a whole bunch of data that helps you prove and understand what the value of the apprenticeship is. So, I promised you a little bit more information about that apprenticeship levy. It is paid by employers with a salary bill of three million pounds or more per year. And they will have 0.5% of that salary bill held in the apprenticeship levy. This is not UK law, this is English law. This is why to any employer in England. The government will add an additional amount of funding to this. Typically they add an additional 10% to whatever your, empl your employer has contributed. And that sits there in the levy pot. Only registered trainers or employers who are on the register of apprenticeship training providers, also going by the catchy acronym ROTAP, don't ask me why, um, can deliver training and claim funding from the ESFA, the Education Skills Funding Agency, i.e. the government. 
They're also the people who fund schools, colleges, universities. Um, so that's where any state-funded education draws their money from. And like any good school or college, uh, those training providers are also Ofsted inspected. So you won't get this with every type of corporate training. You must have this to be part of the register of apprenticeship training providers. So we've got the government checks, and then we've got the Ofsted checks, which is a different branch of government, which is ensuring the training quality, the quality of that provision. As I said, we're not allowed to mark our own homework, so apprenticeships are assessed by an external endpoint assessment organisation, um, or EPAO for another acronym for you. And these guys ensure the consistency of the outcomes. So they make sure that the training provider really has taught the skills and the apprenticeship really does have the level of understanding that they say they do. For us, we use BCS. Um, they also quality check our training provision and quality check through that endpoint assessment. So we're now up to three quality checks for anyone on the register of apprenticeship training providers. And then another quality check, we have to follow those apprenticeship standards. I already mentioned standards. This is basically the specification of what we have to teach, what an apprentice must learn, must be able to do, and also how they're expected to behave in the workplace. And that's put together by employer groups and is managed and approved by the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education. So these guys check what goes into an apprenticeship and hold us accountable for delivery. So that money is going to go through a great quality digital training program. However, those can be prime hires to your organisation or they can be existing staff. So you can use this apprenticeship levy to upskill your employees who are looking to progress in their career or take that next challenge. So you know who your high potential employees are. This is a mechanism you have to help them achieve that potential. Did you know that in the 2017-2018 financial year, eligible employers spent just 9% of available funds on your apprenticeships? That means they accessed 191 million pounds, I could do a lot without money, but there was almost 2.2 billion pounds of levy funds available. So that money just gets wasted unless it gets spent. You have a cutoff point where you have to spend it or you're just donating it to the government. Um, I'm not sure that's what you want to be doing. Good news. The latest data shows that more companies are spending their levy funding. So that gap is closing. But if you're not among the companies who are paying into the levy and using that, fun that funding, that money, you're going to miss out. So why has the government bought this all in place? Why have they introduced levy and credits? And what's the, the fuss all about? Well, those of you who work in recruitment for tech companies are probably aware there's a skills gap in the UK. Employers are reporting that there is a massive shortage of skilled workers who can do the jobs that are sitting there empty. And that's across multiple specialisms. There's been a lot of criticism of the current education system where you have the standard GCSE to a level to degree route, it doesn't fit everyone. We're not a one size fits society and having an education system that expects people to fit into those boxes isn't going to work. It also doesn't suit our employers. Our employers have different needs from the staff who they're employing. 
there's often been cited a lack of practical work experience and common sense in school and university leavers. Now, this is not to say that they are unaware of their subject, it's just some of the practicalities of being in a work environment. That work experience is missing. There's a lot of evidence. If, like me, you are a learning and development nerd, you probably know there's huge amounts of research into the best way to learn, the best way to embed those new concepts and be able to use them rather than just have them locked in your head. Now, the evidence shows that learning by doing, experiential learning for the Kolb fans, um, it increases the transfer of learning. So taking it out of the textbook, out of the classroom, and into the workplace, into the jobs and tasks that you're doing. So apprenticeships are all about using that experience, doing the practical learning. Apprenticeships are there to support career change. And as we see the world of work changing, uh, I refer you to the Taylor Report, um, we see a need for people who've been in a job for life to change into a new role and take on new challenges. So the apprenticeship levy is there to support evolution within the workplace. So how the levy money moves. Uh, this beautiful diagram that I put together, we're going to start on the left-hand side with the employer. Now, we've said that if they have a salary of over 3 million, it's taxed at 0.5% and that's put into the levy pot. And that goes, that's taken by the government and the government's gonna add in that additional 10% contribution. And that's the budget that's sat there. If we go back to the employer again, the employer then has to make a choice. So they need to choose which training provider they're going to use to deliver their apprenticeships. And then they notify the ESFA, we have this number of apprentices and we've chosen this training provider. The ESFA and the training provider then take over the logistics of the money. So the employer never actually sees the money. Once it's gone into the levy, you don't need to touch it again. You just need to notify the ESFA. It's then up to the training provider, in this case I've used the example of Cambridge Spark, to upload something called the ILR, an individual learner record, and they need to do that every month. They submit it to the ESFA through one heck of a complicated form, and fingers crossed the ESFA gives them the money. But there is minimal work there for you as an employer when it comes to spending it. All you have to do is choose who you want to spend it with. For those companies, the smaller companies who are not paying into the apprenticeship levy, this does not mean apprenticeships are off limits or out of bounds. You can access co-investment. Now, how does this work? So this became effective on April the 1st, no joke. And employers pay 5% of the cost of the apprenticeship. Now, apprenticeship costs are in funding bands, again decided by the government. If you look at that Institute for Apprenticeships page with all of the different standards, each standard comes with a maximum cost that a training provider is allowed to put on the apprenticeship. And that's the maximum that the government will pay up to. Some training providers will charge additional costs on top, which aren't able to be drawn down from the levy. So do bear that in mind. Some training providers, to be extra competitive, will charge a lower fee than that top possibility funding band. Um, whatever you've agreed the cost of the apprenticeship to be, we we take 5% um, of that from a non-levy paying company. And that will be paid directly to 
the train the cost of the apprenticeship and again that money is going directly to the training provider so you don't need to be negotiating um, it's all done for you there's nothing practical you have to worry about <laughs> Sorry, getting carried away with my slides, almost missed a fact for you there. Did you know that 80% of employers BCS spoke to said they plan to use apprenticeships to fill their IT gaps? Now, perhaps not so surprising on the grounds this is the British Computer Society. So they do tend to be talking to technical people. And as I mentioned, there are endpoint assessment organisations. So they do that assessment at the end of the apprenticeship and make sure your apprentice knows everything they need to know to be a fully fledged data scientist. It's still a significant number. Um, there are obviously many other training provision possibilities available. Apprenticeships are one that really work. So what is the situation in digital skills? Why are apprenticeships so used to close this digital skills gap and generate that feedback that BCS saw. Well, currently in the European Union, we think we, they, the European Union, estimate that there is a shortage of 346,000 data scientists by 2020. IBM has also reported that data science roles will account for 28% of all roles by 2020. Now, just to clarify, I am not saying that every fourth person you meet on the street will be a data science by profession. What this means is, if you think about your jobs in HR or IT, how much data are you being asked for on a daily basis to prove that you're working, to show that you've got the right people in the right places, to show why particular marketing initiatives are having a bigger impact than other marketing initiatives, where are your clients coming from? You're handling data, and that is only going to increase. So that's what we say about, or what we mean when we say data science roles. It's roles where you are handling that data and having to package it up, present it, and use it to make sound business cases. So how does this connect to tech? Well, stats on the skills gap between tech professionals and demand uh, show how this will increase, um, exactly what we've just seen. We've also seen that there's a gap between the expectations of millennials and Gen X in the workplace and the reality of the situation that they often find themselves in. It's not the, the workplace of their predecessors doesn't suit them. So offering data science training or training in general is part of future-proofing your business and making sure that you're attracting the right talent and you've got the right employer brand. You're investing in your people that's gonna attract a lot more of people from these particular demographics. By upscaling your workforce, we've already seen some data that they will perform better and it's going to increase employee engagement. They're gonna feel that you're investing in them and they're gonna work harder. They're gonna be more passionate ambassadors for your organization and they're gonna show this by working harder. Methods of teaching delivery so conventional classrooms really don't work for a lot of professionals. This is particularly true of technical professionals. If someone's job is to independently sit at a computer and process data sets and calculate algorithms and code and they're 
way of communicating with colleagues is online. Why on earth are you taking them out of that environment and sitting them in a training room and having a teacher at the front with a whiteboard telling them stuff? That's not how they work. That's not how they want to learn. So we're using tech in new ways in training in L&D, not just here at Cambridge Spark, but across the industry and the, and across the profession sorry, of L&D in general. Um, looking at e-learning solutions, how to gamify what L&D is all about and how to align the learner experience with the practical work that they're going to be doing. So this comes back to what we were saying about simulating the work they need to do through digital delivery and experiential learning and recreating the problems they're going to face on a day-to-day -day basis. So a bit about what we as training providers are doing with all this information. We've given you the context about apprenticeships in general. I want to give you some examples of how we're working with employers to use the funding in a way that suits them, suits their learners, um, and perhaps wouldn't have been possible a few years previously. So one of the things we're doing, and the clue was in the name of this webinar, is we have worked with a large employer, um, multinational employer, who have a strong base here in, in the UK and in England specifically, across multiple sites to build a data science academy. So it's a ready to go solution, if you think this sounds interesting. It's scalable. So they have two different locations in England alone. And we can provide the same training experience to those learners in those two sites and potentially to their learners globally. And it's industry driven. It's the employer coming to us and saying, I need to train this number of people to be able to achieve these goals. Can you help me? And we've tailored the content so that it's still compliant with that apprenticeship standard and it's enhanced. It focuses on the aspects of data science that that employer really needs their staff to understand. So the objective of the Data Academy is to embed and enable technical talent assessment development and career progression within that organization. It's important to say that most of their apprentices on this program are experienced talent who have been with their organization for a long time and are finding that they're increasingly using data and need to upskill themselves to be able to function in the new roles that are evolving in the workplace. And it's enabling that employer to embrace brand new, cutting edge, data driven capabilities. They've got apprentices who are learning the very latest skills and applying them the very next day. We've developed a structured upskilling strategy with them and this extracts maximum value from data science. So we're not just teaching them concepts because they're useful, we're teaching them the concepts that are most valuable to that organization. We are developing and implementing this internal data science capability building program. So we've got several cohorts staggered, and we're actually finding that the first cohort is now um, mentoring the second cohort, and the second cohort are really excited to be supporting the future cohorts. It's progressing like that. And this is what I mean about apprentices aren't just learning theory, they're actually learning skills and behavior as well. They're passionate about what they're doing, they want to share it. So the main way that we deliver our training is via remote learning and measurable progression. Management and learning and development leaders within the company have access to a real-time dashboard they can see the feedback an employee is being given on their coding in real time. They can see how many attempts a learner is making to engage with the content and submit their answers. They can see how long an apprentice has spent generating that answer. They can see the moment an answer is submitted. This is the kind of data that for myself 
in learning development has been really difficult to gather, but really helps make sensible decisions about your trainees and how to progress them and how to support them. The Kate dashboard, I mentioned Kate earlier. Kate's the system that we use to deliver the key feedback and the key training content. It enables leaders to monitor employees' progress and the flexible remote delivery. So you could be based in the London office and you can have visibility to which learners are working on which module everywhere across the UK. And the learner can access that at home, in a coffee shop, at their desk. Some apprenticeships you need to go into college or be on a day release. Not all of them and definitely not ours. That module, that learning content is available when your staff want to access it, where your staff want to access it. Um, what else is Cambridge Spark doing? Well, we use data science and AI powered platform, Kate, to teach data science and software engineering. Uh, it's very simple. We want to teach your guys to code better and to apply data science concepts. We know that they will learn that best by coding and testing out the algorithms and the uh, mathematical formulas and applying it in real time. So that, that's what we enable them to do. The subject matter, as I said right at the beginning, is um, delivered by expert tutors and they're there for human support. And we're supporting career conversion. We're supporting people being upskilled. We're supporting reskilling. Cambridge Spark also runs boot camps. That's something we've been doing since our very beginning. And then we're delivering these apprenticeships as demand is increasing in this area. We've shown you what the data academies we're building look like. We've shown you that we have a flexible, modular approach. So we can deliver different aspects of content in the order you as an employer want it delivered. And as I said, it's remote access. So your learners can access and engage with that content at any time. Employer support is available. Um, so any new employer that comes on board will be talking to me and we'll be making sure that your learners are in the best situation and have access to all the resources they need. And you've got those analytics in that dashboard. So quantifiable L&D data. It's like gold dust in the profession. How would it work? Well, if you wanted to work with us, we're going to offer you support right from the very beginning. Um, make sure whoever your training provider is that you go with, you're asking them about how they're going to get you to starting that apprenticeship. We also believe that the apprentice is a very important part of this whole process. So we want them to apply to you to show that they're interested. We want to help you market the concept of apprenticeships to showcase who they're for and what they can do. There's some eligibility checks. There's also some technical assessment. We want to make sure we only let people on the program who are going to be able to complete it and that they're the right people for this apprenticeship. And we're going to work with you through those eligibility checks. We're then going to announce who's in the cohort. It's your decision at the end of the day. They're your apprentices. As long as they've met our basic requirements, it's up to you who you put on the program. We're going to welcome them make sure they've got the information and they understand the journey that they are embarking on. There's some things that we're going to need. So we do need some certificates to prove their uh, previous learning, to prove if they've got GCSE maths and English. If they don't, don't panic. We provide that to apprentices who have not completed their functional skills, GCSE maths and English. And we're going to work with the line managers as well. Um, everything kicks off at an in-person induction. So this is where we sign um, the apprenticeship agreements and it's all three of us in the room, the apprentice, the employer and representative of Cambridge Park. We make sure everyone has the resources they need, 
they understand how to log into our systems, they understand the expectations with regards to work, and we sign an agreement that solidifies that. That is the moment the apprenticeship starts, and that is the moment that the ESA, ESFA funding starts. That's where we say that they are on the programme. What does that programme structure look like? Well, it will vary. Please note the fact that we haven't actually put timeline on this. It shows you stages, but it could be over 12 months. It could be over a longer time period. There will be the modules of content, which again, we will agree with yourselves and ensure that they match the specifications in that apprenticeship standard. Throughout the whole time, your learner will have access to a knowledge assessment teaching engine, if you've been wondering what that acronym stood for. And that's how they're getting instant feedback, instant support. They can see if their coding works. They can see if they've got the right algorithms in place. They can see how they're interacting with the data sets and what the results are. Also, throughout the duration of the apprenticeship, they're going to build a portfolio of data science projects. Now, this is something not every apprenticeship standard will require it. For the technical standards that we deliver, this is a requirement. It's also really useful best practice. It means that your apprentice can reflect back and see what they've achieved, how far they've come. We are regularly checking. We want to make sure our learners are happy, engaged, they understand it, and they feel supported. And if there's anything more we could be doing, we want to hear about it. So at the end of every module, you're going to get a survey. We do quarterly group presentations, and I can see we've got two out of three on this one. Um, but every quarter, every three months, we're going to have a presentation. We're going to engage with the learners. We're going to get them to share some of the work that they've been doing with their peers. It's a really collaborative session. It's fun, actually. I really enjoy those. Um, we also have some additional examinations that for the level four data analyst standard are a requirement. You have to do these qualifications and you won't be allowed through endpoint assessment unless you've done them. So functional skills, I've already mentioned GCSE maths and English. And if you are not able to provide certificates showing that you've passed this, we will um, be able to deliver that for you. For international employers who you would like to send on as long they are employed in England, they are eligible, and if they have equivalent to GCSE Math and English from a different country, it can be credited and approved. So I know you have to duplicate what they've already done. We have the yes, knowledge exam, and we have a Dell AMC data science exam. So at the end of that, I get Dell. EMC to analyst certification, as well as the apprenticeship. Then there is the gateway assessment. So that's where we, as the training providers, look at the work that the apprentice has done. We look at the, look at the skills they've shown in their work on Kate. And we decide, yeah, you know what, you've got it, you're ready to go. And we put them forward for the endpoint assessment. So the endpoint assessment for this particular standard involves multiple components. The first thing is, is before they reach gateway, um, we're going to check, and you're going to check, and we're all going to check that the right projects chasing their abilities are in that portfolio. We're also going to have an employer reference from the apprentice's line manager talking about the work that they've done and the skills that they've shown. When we're confident that they're ready to go, we will upload the information for you with BCS. So again, nothing for you as an employer to do. And we are going to send all of that information to BCS. BCS have an initial look at the work we've sent across and can send any additional feedback to us so we can make any corrections. We then have what's, what is called the Synoptic Project. So this is a top secret project that they will not have seen before and the apprentices have three to five working days. These are days away from their desk, 
Uh, it can be on site, but it must be invigilated. So it will be three to five days to complete that project. And that project is submitted to showcase all of their skills. Cambridge Spark are checking it and we're sending it to BCS. And the final stage of that endpoint assessment with the portfolio and the employer reference and the outcomes of that synoptic project is an interview by BCS, someone completely external, and they're gonna look at all that information, they're gonna look at the standard and what the expected skills, knowledge and behaviors are at the end of an apprenticeship, and they're gonna sit down with the apprentice and ask them for more information to really make sure everything is in place. A grade will be given and everything goes according to plan and if it doesn't we've not done our job properly um, that apprentice will receive their certificate within a few weeks so to summarize we've made it to the end apprenticeships can be for early careers or experienced talent within your business apprenticeships blend theory and experiential learning the levy funding is there to be used, please use it. And even if you are not paying the apprenticeship levy, you can still engage with apprenticeships and there are cost-effective ways to do this. There are a wide range of apprenticeship standards and there are a wide range of training. Do how we do things. We do it that way because we believe it works. We've tried and tested it for our learners, but our subject area, this is the best way we've found. If you're looking for something different, trust me, there are many, many options out there and many other standards, many other subject areas. Benefits for businesses include increased productivity, Increased talent retention. Apprentices are far more loyal than other employees. And diversity. You can bring in and support people from a variety of backgrounds to do their best work in your workplace. So thank you very much. If you want to get in touch with us, please do. Here's our contact details and we are always happy to talk about digital skills training. It's what we're passionate about, especially data science. Um, have we got any questions coming through? If you have any questions, now is the time to share them. If not, I'm gonna say thank you very much and please don't hesitate to get in touch in future. Thank you.